First of all, it was survival. With every day that you survived, you've learned something. And if you haven't learned anything, you didn't survive very long. I don't think that a fighter pilot, in general terms, can be concerned really over anything when he's about to enter combat. His objective is to destroy the enemy. And he uses all the experience and talent at his fingertips. He knows his machine, he knows the enemy, and he knows what his job is. On December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made man's first four controlled flights in a powered airplane. That day, they lifted the world into a new dimension. What the Wrights had achieved at Kitty Hawk barely evoked passing attention in a nation whose people were absorbed with the problems of a dynamic new age. The Wrights had offered to demonstrate their airplane to the United States Army shortly after their first successful flights. The Army declined, preferring to develop its small fleet of balloons as an air arm. Oddly, it was a young balloonist lieutenant of the Army who finally was instrumental in obtaining a chance for the Wrights and their airplane, Frank P. Long. After four long years of failing to recognize the Wrights, finally, in December of 1907, the Board of Ordnance and Fortification granted the interview to Wilbur. At once, he inspired their confidence. This led to a contract in February of 1908 between the Wright brothers and the Signal Corps, in which they agreed to furnish an airplane that would fly 40 miles an hour, carry two persons, remain in the air for one hour, and, strange to relate, was to have some kind of a device by which, in case the motor stopped, it could be landed without crashing. In the summer of 1908, Orville Wright brought to Fort Myer, Virginia, the airplane that was to fill their specifications of the contract. Day after day, we watched him fly around and around the field in his tuning up flights. And finally, on the 9th of September, he broke the world's record by staying in the air for over one hour. Another young Army lieutenant, Benjamin Folloy, had a chance to fly in the right plane at Fort Myer. On the day following the endurance uh, test with Global Wright and uh, Lieutenant Lahm, uh, the Orville with a quiet little grin on his face, uh, invited me to be his guest on the uh, crucial and final cross-country and speed tests. On July 30th, we took off on the uh, final cross-country and speed test. Shortly after we straightened out on the course for Alexandria, Orville, with this same little grin on his face, told me that uh, if he had to land anywhere on the route, and he'd pick out the thickest clump of trees he could find and land on top of them. Fortunately, the little engine that we had at the time carried us all the way through without any difficulty. And we finally landed back at Fort Myer Drill Ground with three world records, cross country, 10 miles, altitude 600 feet, and speed 42 and a half miles an hour. The United States Army had an airplane. The need now was for pilots. There in the fall of 1909, under Wilbur Wright's instruction, a Lieutenant F. E. Humphrey of U.S. engineers and myself were taught to fly and at the end of some three hours were soloed 
and told we were pilots. So in 1909, the military airplane was mated to the military pilot. pistol shot at Sarajevo, the first of the great modern world wars exploded. And almost overnight, all of Europe was engulfed in conflict. The airplane was put to work just as the U.S. War Department spokesman had prophesied, as observation and scouting craft. The source of peril lay in the artillery, machine gun, and rifle fire, scourging the entrenched troops from across the wasted land. But in the air, Allied and German pilots often waved to each other as they passed on their observation missions. Then, instead of the courteous wave, the opposing pilots began exchanging pistol fire. Presently, the first crudely mounted machine guns appeared. Now, the frantic race of inventing, improvising, adapting, and refining aircraft equipment began. Quickly, the Germans countered the hand-operated machine gun, by installing upon their aircraft the invention of Tony Fokker, a machine gun synchronized to fire through the aircraft propeller. A paramount lesson that the Allies were to remember a generation later was being learned in air warfare for the first time. No design capable of still further development could be frozen. in which European antagonists had been tempered by three years of savage battle, whose equipment had been perfected by the necessity of survival without regard to cost, the United States now plunged. It was the world's 14th ranking air power with only 28 airplanes, 65 pilots, supplemented by 50 flying students. Its Navy combat air arm was even smaller. Its industry lacked integration. The nation that had allotted Benny Folloy $150 in 1910 for maintenance of that year's Air Force promptly voted $600 million to fulfill a plea by the Allies to have 5,000 airplanes and 4,500 pilots on the Western Front by the spring of 1918. Believe me, we were far from ready. I was a rookie cadet, I ought to know. They gave us wooden guns and told us we were going to turn the tide. You know, in a couple of weeks, we began to look as though we might do it. For training equipment, we molded our own bombs out of plaster. Pretty soon, we trained with the real things, Lewis machine guns. Having met the requirements, we were issued leather flying togs and helmets. Assignments were made. We got a chance to fly. First, we made a pre-flight check of the bailing wire planes. Then we tried our wings. Fifty hours in the air, a few bombs. We were checked out, ready for advanced training overseas. America was producing airmen, but we didn't have a single fighting airplane. Only a few of our leaders were wise. Newton Baker, Secretary of War, was one. He insisted supremacy of the air in modern warfare is essential. Woodrow Wilson was another. Some of us half-trained flyers went to Britain and Italy, but most of us went to France. There we found cities of wooden barracks and muddy streets. In outdoor classes, we practiced gunnery. Wooden models helped us learn how to lead a plane with our fire. Battle-tested aviators took time out from the war to show us how to handle the stick. Finally, we soloed. The 
first ride was always a thrill and a bumpy experience. However, it was much easier to talk about turning the tide than to produce fighting aces overnight, even if some of us were lucky. Late in 1917, France met the AEF's first Aero Squadron, commanded by Major Ralph Royce. His outfit was the first to see action, and they proudly pasted paper iron crosses over enemy bullet holes. Our commander was Colonel Billy Mitchell. America's first flyers were there. General Benjamin Falloy in command of supply and schools. Colonel Thomas Milling, head of air service units, 1st Army and Colonel Frank Lam for the 2nd Army, commanded by General Bullard. When Major William Thor and the Lafayette Escadrille became the 103rd Aero Squadron, they brought a record of triumphs. Thor, five German planes down. Lieutenant Larner, three. Lieutenant Merrick, one. Lieutenant Tobin, three. Don't forget the aces. Captain Field Kindley with 12 victories and Major Raoul Luffberry with 17 before they were both grounded forever. The pilots of World War I made the term dogfight synonymous with their work. America's top ace, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed 94th Hat in Ring Squadron, reflects on the different approaches to combat of the pilots of World War I and the pilots of today. That individualism uh, was possible because the planes were much slower. You'd stay in maneuver. When it was flown properly by a man who knew how to handle it, I don't believe there was a more maneuverable airplane in the war than the Sopwith Camel, except possibly maybe the German uh, Fokker triplane. That war was probably the first time that there was an opportunity to use an aircraft of any type for wartime purposes. I flew Sopwith Camels. Colonel George Vaughn flew the legendary little fighter against Germany's best and became America's fourth ranking World War I ace. Allied air power struck back in force. The sky was a beehive of battle. We overwhelmed their air defense, winning and holding air superiority. It was almost the same a few weeks later in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, where we bombed with telling effect in the most notable aerial effort of the war. November 11, 1918, closed a chapter in the unending story of the United States Air Force. Visual history has shown us some of the courageous men, in uniform and out, who cradled the dream of flight and gave us aviation. wave of enemy planes bombed American aircraft and units of the Pacific Fleet in a treacherous attack which achieved perfect tactical surprise. Other Japs went after U.S. fighters on auxiliary fields. In spite of the terrific pounding, our pilots and mechanics were able to get four P-40s and two P-36s in the air within the first 30 minutes and offer some resistance. In the face of overwhelming odds, Lieutenants Harry Brown, Robert Rogers, Kenneth Taylor, John Webster and George Welch, among many others, fought back as best they could. The Jap squadrons returned to their carriers with a loss of only 49 planes, a cheap price for so great a victory. At the end of the single air attack, the United States had suffered a crushing blow, and the nation was at war. For the enemy, the situation worsened. Gasoline shortages reduced air operations. Squeezed into a steadily smaller pocket, they prepared to evacuate planes and key personnel to Sicily. 
about 20 men could escape in a Junker 52. High above them, the Allies watched and waited. Something big was coming. The German escape plan was put in motion. Near Tunis rose a group of more than 30 heavily armored ME-109 fighters. They were to escort a large fleet of slow-flying 52s. The hop to Sicily was a shuttle run of about 100 miles, less than an hour. A hundred strong, the transport stretched in a long line on the deck, headed for their Sicilian sanctuary. They didn't get very far. As soon as our 57th fighter group spotted them, Captain Jimmy Curl's squad of 13 P-40s dove on the enemy to split them up. We had been chasing Germans since July 1942, but we never had a chance like this famous afternoon. below, the transports droned on. If their luck held, the Germans might make a getaway. Their luck ran out. The tail end Charlies of the long escape line took their chances on getting back to their Cape Bon Air drone. them made it the hard way. When the attack was over, we had destroyed 58 transports and 18 fighters. Lieutenants Duffy, Powers, and Cleveland each clobbered five transports. From then on, we sat over German airdromes and dared the Luftwaffe to come up. In the Pacific, fighter operations make headlines. Colonel John Mitchell plans a bold, daring mission to shoot down the commander-in-chief of the Japanese Imperial Navy. Ground crews modify his P-38s for extended range and performance. We took off from Guadalcanal. I was leading the flight. We knew that he would be in a Betty-type bomber and that he would be escorted by uh, Zeros. When I made landfall, I was about one minute ahead of the time that I had planned to be there, which was rather incredible when you think about it because it was uh, as I said, I had no checkpoints, anything else, all the way up there. So it was unbelievable, almost, that we happened to be there at the time we what? I knew that we had our man. I knew that we had him. As soon as this happened, why, we got the hell out of there because the mission was accomplished. In that deadly airspace over the Japanese fleet, what was it like to push over a dive bomber at two miles up and go whistling down to a gun-filled deck? Uh, you were keyed up, of course, and you were apprehensive of what was taking place. Uh, but due to the fact that we'd had many training missions, we were real seasoned. So I think the only, the only uh, uh, thing that you had was the apprehension of, uh, of whether you're going to make that bomb hit on that deck or not. But you were kind of thinking of that only, nothing else. There was nothing else in your thoughts. And we were just doing the job that you were trained to do, and that was it. Bob Ryder, radio man and gunner, tells how it looked from the rear seat. The radio man, the 
call out the altitude to the pilot as he's coming down. 9,000, 8,000, 7,000. And at 2,000 feet, you'd haul a drop. But then we'd uh, level the plane out. At this point, you were beginning to look out for this uh, heavy uh, flak. And you could uh, see this pattern of uh, explosions behind you, and you could hear this old bulldog-type sound going woof, woof, woof. If you tell the pilot to pull it up, and this woof, woof sound would go underneath you. For the fighter pilots, even though they worked in teams, it was still, in the end, one man alone in his plane. What does it take to make a good fighter pilot? Gene Valencia, a top Navy ace who won 23 and lost none, sums it up. He has to be aggressive. He has to love to fight. He has to love to tangle. But he does not, and he cannot do it foolishly. He has to know the performance of his aircraft. It's that simple. Simple? Another Navy pilot, Hamilton McWhorter, remembers that combat flying is not an occupation that accepts errors of judgment. You don't get a chance to make but one mistake. Usually that one mistake is, is the last one. The enemy's flyers meet our attackers with skilled airmanship. Our naval aviators in combat for the first time fight against heavy odds. The enemy pilots are more experienced. Their fighter plane, the Zero, though lightly armored, is faster and more maneuverable than our Wildcat. Fighter ace Gene Valencia had great respect for his opponents. He didn't tangle with them alone. If he did, you were crazy. And I don't know any fighter pilot that will tell you he fought plane for plane with the Zero. And we did have to depend on each other. It was a matter of tactics. The rule was to fly always in formations of two or four fighters. And the basic tactic, conceived by Lieutenant John Thatch, became known as the Thatch Weave. You can't shoot anything if you can't bring your guns around to bear on it. I would ask myself, now what should we do if we're flying along in a formation? Let's say we've got four planes, two sections, and we saw an enemy. Well, if you're if you think the enemy can outperform you, you don't turn and run, because he can catch you, and, and you'll be easy target. You turn toward him. Try to keep turning toward him so he can't get on your tail. I wasn't sure how well this would work, so I went out one morning, and I got a hold of a young man named Butch O'Hare, and gave him four airplanes, and I took four. It really worked. Edward O'Hare, one of the first aviator heroes of World War II, helped perfect the art of night fighting and scored feats like shooting down five enemy planes in a single engagement. One night, he didn't come back. Chicago's International Airport was given his name. Alexander Vrashew, a top Navy fighter ace himself, flew with O'Hare as his wingman. He had a way of... Uh presenting a problem not only in the air by example, but by quietly explaining it in a little more detail on the ground if need to be. But you got the message uh, rather quickly and in a way that uh, it stuck with you. Little things like maybe conserving fuel, looking over your shoulder at the right time, or at least before making a run or making an attack. And I can safely say that I saved my life a couple of times by remembering little rules like this. One subject is strictly taboo. In the wardroom, after a mission, as they count empty chairs, their only comment is bleeding silence. The one thing that I've tried to keep with me when I lost friends, uh, my fellow pilots, uh, and pilots that I didn't know so well in my various commands, was that that individual was doing something that he loved. The Wildcat fighter gives way to the Hellcat and Corsair. Swifter, more agile, they fly higher and have better guns. The dive bombing Dauntless is succeeded by the Helldiver. The torpedo plane Devastator by the Avenger. The Navy gives them letter number designations like F6F, and SB2C. 
the pilots have their own names for planes they dislike, such as Beast and Turkey. But the Hellcat wins a famous tribute from Gene Valencia. Well, I was so happy with the plane, when I got back aboard the Yorktown, I said if the F6F could cook, I'd marry it. We were awfully proud of it. It was a rugged plane. It maybe wasn't quite as maneuverable as the uh, Zero, but it could, it could stay with it. And uh, it was tough. In February 1944, the task force tackles the heavily fortified island of Truk, main anchorage of the enemy's Central Pacific Fleet, called the Japanese Gibraltar. Captain Armistead B. Smith found himself in history's greatest dogfight in which our tactics and new planes paid off 15 to 1. The enemy put up a lot of airplanes, and they began attacking, and they didn't stop attacking for the entire operation. Every time you turned around, you could anticipate another airplane. I had a lot of luck, and I shot down three airplanes, but at the same time, I got shot down myself. At truck, as in other Pacific battles, submarines aid in picking up downed aviators. Retired Rear Admiral Richard O'Kane skippered the tank. About noon on the first day, we received the first report. By the time the tank finished the job, it was on course for Pearl Harbor with 22 very happy downed pilots on its passenger list. As far as I know, and I've, I've inquired, uh, every, every lad that came down alive uh, was rescued. Uh, there were no prisoners taken. Moving closer to the Japanese homeland leads to one of the great Navy legends, an overwhelming air victory that a flyer nicknames the Marianas Turkey Shoot. Later in the June afternoon, Mark Mitcher sends his flyers after the retreating enemy at extreme range. Alexander Brashu was one of those flyers. I know that a lot of us gave a salute as we were going across the deck because we figured that that was the longest uh, carrier strike. Uh, it just didn't seem uh, too probable that uh, some of us may get back. So, but we went into it with that realization and uh, before you know it, the two hours passed and we hit them somewhere around 6.30 just before uh, sunset. Mission accomplished. But night has fallen. In the dark, hundreds of flyers grope their way home, fuel running low, unable to locate the carriers. Aboard the Hornet, Rear Admiral Jocko Clark gives the word to his carrier task group. Lights on. The task force takes a calculated risk that no enemy forces are within striking distance. Admiral Mitcher passes the order. Across the whole task force, running lights and searchlights pierce the black night to guide the pilots in. We knew that there were land-based aircraft up come, that could come down from Iwo Jima from that area. And there might be, there might be some Japanese uh, carrier aircraft too. But the Admiral said just as soon as we got into the wind, turn on, we turn on the light. Alexander Brashu was returning. I just couldn't believe uh, that anyone would turn on the lights. Uh, it was against, like you say, all doctrine. It was against all experience. It wasn't until they said, land at nearest base, and, uh, that, and then the signal getting stronger, that I was able to visualize that it was, in reality, that very point that the lights were turned up for us. Among the first fighter pilots to arrive in Darwin, Australia in August 1942 was Lieutenant Bong, a member of the 49th Fighter Group flying P-38. It didn't take long for him to become known in the air over the southwestern Pacific. Soon after arriving, Bong had eight victories to his credit. And he had become leader of the 9th Fighter Squadron. As the combined American forces slowly pushed the enemy back toward the Philippines, Bong flew cover for light and heavy bombers, taking on enemy aircraft wherever he found them. With 28 confirmed combat victories, Dick Bong returned to the United States for advanced gunnery training in April 1944. Soon he was back in Australia as a gunnery instructor for 5th Air Force fighter pilots. 
By this time, the battle for Leyte was going on. And even while the naval fighting continued, work was rushed to put its airstrips back into shape to receive fighter planes. Enemy aircraft, based on the west coast of Leyte, raided day and night. Dick Bong was there, flying missions every day and winning more victories. The Japanese stronghold was at Ormuk Bay. Twelve times they sent convoys to reinforce their garrison there, and twelve times the 5th Air Force turned them back. The last Japanese convoy to be hit was in December of 1944. By now, Dick Baum had 38 combat victories. On the afternoon of December 12, 1944, in front of a guard of honor consisting of 12 pilots, each of whom had 12 or more air combat victories, General Douglas MacArthur pinned the coveted Medal of Honor on Major Richard Baum. The citation read in part as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action, above and beyond the call of duty, in the Southwest Pacific area, from 10 October to 15 November, 1944. Though assigned to duty as gunnery instructor and neither required nor expected to perform combat duty, Major Bong voluntarily and at his own request engaged in repeated combat missions, including unusually hazardous sorties over Balapapan, Borneo, and in the Leyte area of the Philippines. During the week that followed, Major Bong won two more victories over the enemy. They were numbers 39 and 40. After more than two years and hundreds of missions, Major Bong returned to the United States in January of 1945. Our objective was to keep the fighters from getting to the bombers at the time that I was there. And uh, the German fighters were there to destroy the bombers. They weren't there to destroy the fighters. In other words, they avoided the fighters if they could. And it was up to us again to see that the bombers could make that round trip back again tomorrow after hitting their industrial complex. So when you say how good were they, I can think in terms of a 109 that was very maneuverable with a, a clean airplane, then I know 109 that had two 20-millimeter uh, external pods. It wasn't the maneuver, but it had armament that was set up against the B-17, destruction of B-17, and the B-24s. And then in the German pilots that were Marines from <coughs> those you really felt sorry for. The other day, obviously, could hardly handle the airplane, let alone combat. That was, became more prevalent at the end of the war. I also ran into the one that I thought was the Red Baron himself. And if I hadn't had a P-51, I probably wouldn't be here. Well, I think your situation back in 1945 was entirely different from what it was in 1943 and early 1944. In other words, those were the days where Germany was fighting for its life. 1945, the life was already gone. It was a body just kind of gasping for air. But it was a real war for the guys that were out there doing the fighting. Airplanes an airplane out there. You don't de differentiate between a Falk Group 190 and 109. In other words, you attack when you have the advantage. And if you don't have the advantage, you don't attack. And if you're caught with your pants down, then you're in trouble. There's one thing you never did with the P-47. You never pulled back on that truck. It was all the way forward whenever you were over Germany maximum power and it, it wasn't the best airplane in other words it didn't respond like a spitfire or a p-51 it should take a lot more 
and his head took a lot of punishment. But that's not what we were there for. <laughs> Nothing's ever premeditated in the war. You do what you've got to do. And when the airplane exploded in front of me, all I have to do then is hope that I don't hit the engine. I push the stick forward, and the debris came through my little vent. We didn't have pressurization. So it came through the vent, and I picked up a lot of particles, but the leading edge of the wing was crushed by the large, larger particles. But it was a P-47 that returned home. And that was a day that I had 20 millimeter shells. This was a 110. Uh, that I destroyed. I had 20 millimeter shells lodged in my uh, uh, cylinders. They were still alive. Uh, they weren't expended. They were things that fell out of the airplane. The airplane exploded. But, uh, changing from the 51 to 47, and we did that when the wind started coming off the 51. And we were doing a lot of dive bombing. Uh, it's like getting out of a Porsche and into a truck and trailer. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to change your tactics. You really do. In a P-47, in other words, you can't fly the P-47 like a Spitfire. You can't fly it like a P-51. You've got to fly it like a P-47. In other words, it's a good diving airplane. When you came uh, when, with the uh, P-47, early P-47, Razorback, it wasn't the airplane that, uh, that you saw back in 1944, at a later date. You had paddle blade props, you had uh, water injection, and you had a good visible canopy, a bubble canopy. So you had a new airplane, it was a new ball game. Sure. I thought it was, 47 was a consistent airplane. It, Cruise at 190, climb at 190, and dove at 190. <laughs> well, no, that's that's when they were tied down. <laughs> I've got a, a good friend now, Franz Stiegler. He shot down 26 of our planes. He lives in Vancouver, BC. <laughs> but he uh, he's the first German pilot I ever found who admitted he flew against us. Yeah, the, the they were always on the east. Yeah, right. every the first right. thing they right. say is eastern front. General Gunther who's here, yeah. the Gatling the Eagle thing, he, uh, he's, he's pretty straightforward about it. I mean, he's spent time in both, uh, both fronts. He shot down 178 airplanes, and asked him, how many missions did he have? He says, well, he says, we, uh, we only flew when we had to, and we had to fly all the time. He says, I lost count. He says, upwards of a thousand missions oh, sure. wow. in, in combat. They flew exactly. sometimes five times a day. Yeah. All they had to do was take off and go straight up. That's right. We had <laughs> I, asked them, I asked him, how many times have you bailed out? He says, five times. Well, Franz shot down 26 of our planes, but he run down 16. Yeah, he, okay. he, he bailed out 11 times. Over his own territory. He bailed out 11 yeah. times and crash landed. Yeah. And they put yeah. him in an airplane and sent him back. And they put him in another airplane and sent him back up. And he's got a, a, a very distinctive mark of, of, of depression in his forehead. Just exactly the width of a 30 caliber bullet, a <coughs> bullet from a tail gunner in a B-17. Just bounced one off his skull. <laughs> We had some great pilots. You did? You I, did. We were escorting bombers one day on loan with the 8th Air Force, and, and uh, we got into a big fight, and everybody got separated. And I heard, believe me, heard Glenn Eagleson say, Hey, you guys, I'm back at the back end of the bombers. I got 20 of them cornered, and I'm all alone. <laughs> and he meant it. Yeah. He meant it. We were crossing the Ruhr Valley. Yeah, they they yeah, Somebody's microphone And they were singing, Marums and Dotes and Dotes and Dotes. <laughs> Bradley was leading the floor mission and he was out of his mind trying to get whoever it was to shut up, check the buttons. And he finally <laughs> said, everybody who can hear me, Rock your wing. Well, if you got 48 planes and 47 of them start rocking their wings, <laughs> whoever the other guy was, he looked and he started. <laughs> hey, that's a group. And, that's then group. We, <laughs> and then we, and then we started across the Ruhr Valley, and all of a sudden the anti-aircraft came up, 
and the singing stopped like that, and you could hear her going, <gasps> <laughs> and Bradley says, sing now, you son. <laughs> the creation of the Air Force. The research and development projects initiated during and immediately after the war began to bear fruit. General Frank Everest recalls. Uh, many, many scientists and engineers said we will never go through the sound barrier. Now, obviously, that was immediately crushed by uh, Jaeger, the first guy to fly it through the speed of sound. Jaeger, of course, checked me out in the X-1, and he had finished uh, taking it up through Mach 1, and I was going to go for altitude. I rode in the cockpit of the B-29 because the B-29 climbed at 180 miles an hour, and the stalling speed of the X-1 was 240 indicated. So I waited until I got above 12,000 feet before I came down a ladder and got into the cockpit of the X-1. And on that particular flight, after dropping at 25,000 feet and in a slight climb with four rocket chambers on, I was sitting there looking at about 9596 Mach number indicated when the Mach meter began to fluctuate and went off the scale. And when it went off the scale, all the buffeting stopped on the airplane. It started flying real smooth, and I got back some elevator effectiveness. The most important thing that came out of the whole X-1 program, we found out that we needed a flying tail on the airplane if we were going to operate in the region of the speed of sound. In the summer of 1950, recruits for the Air Force were arriving at training bases in increasing numbers. There was a mean war on over in Korea. And so far, things weren't going well for our side. The Reds were pushing our ground forces all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. Our air strength was proving the biggest single factor in keeping us from being driven off the peninsula. That air strength had to be kept up and increased. On 1 November 1950, enemy air suddenly re-entered the war in a dangerous way. In other words, the Russian-built MiG-15s made their debut in Korea. Our F-80s take on the MiGs. F-86s have been sent for, but in the meantime, the F-80s do all right. It was in an F-80 that Lieutenant Russell Brown shot down the first MiG, the first of many. Cameras mounted on the wings of our fighters automatically photographed the air battle. As fighting aircraft, the F-80s were decidedly inferior to the MiGs, but our old jets were much better handled. The F-80s more than held their own because of the superior skill of our pilots. December 1950, our F-86s went into action against the MiGs. And now began one of the brightest chapters in the story of our air forces in the Korean conflict. Here we are in the pilot briefing room of an F-86 squadron. Hello, fighter sweep of day. In this area right here, we'll start engines as I indicated on, on the board. Here's the plan. Uh, the first four flights into the area will stay below the contrails and keep a, a close watch on the fighter bombers. The last two flights will go above the contrails and check very closely for any MiG aircraft that might come in above the con. Now, if you see MiGs up there today, call them out. Give their altitude, direction, and geographical location on the, on the map. And call them out and then get off the radio. Now remember, once you look around, keep your speed up, and if you do get a bounce, cut him off, and drive in, in range. When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go get him. Now 
for MiG Alley, that wide band of airspace over northwest Korea infested by the enemy jets. I recall that day the mix came out of the Yalu Sanctuary and crossed the, crossed the river. And there were about uh, 16 of them flying together in formation, and I had a formation of four airplanes. At that moment, I dispelled everything from my mind with one exception. I was determined to shoot down that lead airplane. That was my fifth airplane. That closed in real close again. Of course, in many of my instances, I flew through the airplane. The airplane exploded, and there was no question in my mind that he was destroyed. Our F-86s had this great advantage over the Russian-built MiGs. They were better handled. Simply as aircraft, the MiGs were at least the equal of the F-86s, and the enemy had a lot of them. They usually outnumbered the F-86s, sometimes by as much as three or four to one but our pilots were much more skillful than theirs. This was the big reason that we destroyed eight times as many of their fighters as they did of ours. During the entire war, 827 MiGs were down. We lost 112 jet aircraft in air-to-air -air combat. to evade our missile. You don't simply climb into the world's fastest, most high-performance military jet and go for a joyride. Before you can get close to the airplane, it takes days of indoctrination, ejection seat drills, decompression chamber and physical qualification clearance, and jungle survival training. But at 18,000 feet, at 200 miles from the target, it's difficult to believe you're in the center of a military conflict with the stillness and sheer beauty that surrounds you. Even the familiar demilitarized zone, the center of bitter fighting, looks peaceful below. Once the target is hit and you're on your way home, another anxious moment may be in store for you. Phantom jets absorb fuel at a startling rate and often require fueling in flight by Marine C-130 flying gas stations, a delicate and precise maneuver. I'm sure Randy would agree with this. There are some things in the air combat maneuvering environment that are always the same, that don't change. There are certain attitudes and philosophies that were the same in World War I and World War II and today. There are, are some 
refinements and subtleties, of course, in the jet age that certainly did not exist back in the propeller age. But in the final analysis, it's, it's one man in a, in a machine versus another man in a machine. And there are certain things that we could talk about in fighter air-to-air -air tactics. And we could talk with a World War I fighter pilot or World War II fighter pilot. And the things that we would talk about would be almost exactly identically the same. We, we have a, a firm belief at the Navy Fighter Weapons School. The first man to see the other man is probably going to win. And if he doesn't win, he's probably not going to lose, be it on radar or be it through eyeball. Times uh, have changed a little since the time of Rick Tobin, uh, Oswald Boca, uh, Emmelman, oh. Galan, and uh, since the time of McCampbell, the, the biggest difference that we face is that we only saw MiGs three times. At one time, there was a mass of MiGs up. But uh, when McCampbell was flying, they had large formations going against large formations. Uh, they brought 100 and raised you two. in general terms, can be concerned really over anything when he's uh, about to enter combat. His objective is to destroy the enemy. And he uses all the experience and talent at his fingertips. He knows his machine, he knows the enemy, and he knows what his job is. Can you go ahead and do it? Today, many countries around the world must guard their borders against possible sudden attack. The scene may be much like this, the potential enemy only minutes away. The first line of defense is tactical air power. The need is for quick response, high performance, and the ability to fly again and again and again with only the aircraft, the men, and the supplies at hand. Current generation fighters offer high performance, but most are not as reliable as they need to be. Operating and support costs are high. Aircraft availability is low. Only now, with the new technology of the 80s, is it possible to have a fighter with both high performance and reliability. This is the F-20 Tiger Shark, America's newest tactical fighter. The F-20 is the most dependable fighter flying today, with the performance and modern systems needed to dominate the tactical air combat arena on air-to-air, -air, air to ground, and air-to-sea missions. Retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Charles E. Chuck Yeager. Forty years ago, I shot down my first fighter using a ring and bead gun sight in a P-51. Now, the air combat arena of today is so lethal that if you're not flying a fighter with current technology, chances are you'll never see the guy that shoots you down. In the old days, we wasted a lot of time trying to maneuver around on the tail of an airplane to use your gun or get into the envelope of the old missile systems. But the object today is to strap your fanny to a 9G fighter with an engine you don't have to worry about and with an advanced avionics system that gives you the capability of managing all of your weapon systems without even looking in the cockpit or taking your hands off the stick and throttle. The object today is to aim and shoot. And the guy that does that first wins. If you don't, you lose. It's that simple. For air defense, the need is to get off the ground fast with modern weapons, to make the intercept quickly and to maneuver rapidly. The F-20 carries up to six Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles and can simultaneously employ Sparrows, 
and Sidewinders, the Tiger Shark will also carry the new generation Amram medium range missile. You're on strip alert. A low flying, high speed intruder is detected 80 miles from your base in the Tiger Shark. You can respond faster than in any other fighter in the world today. With its self contained cartridge starter, the Tiger Shark's engine reaches idle power in 19 seconds. Its laser inertial navigator aligns in 22 seconds to an accuracy of better than one nautical mile per hour with a clutter free radar target display and front aspect weapons firing capability. Less than a minute from a cold start, you're airborne. While other fighters are still on the ground and vulnerable. Your combat information comes on two display indicators, all digital. The F-20's pulse Doppler radar has more than eight times the detection volume of conventional pulse radars. You can detect fighter size intruders up to 48 miles away, look up, 31 miles away, look down. The track while scan mode tracks up to 10 threat aircraft and prioritizes up to eight for maximum situation awareness. In less than three minutes from the alert, you're 20 miles from base flying faster than Mach 1. With the F-20's look down radar, you're locked on to the low flying intruder. Pilots in current frontline fighters would only now be breaking ground. Controls on the stick and throttle reduce your workload. Select radar modes, weapons, Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles, and head up display. You never need take your eyes off the target. In less than four minutes and 38 miles out, you employ front aspect weapons to make the intercept. For close-in maneuvering, the need is to point and shoot first. The F-20's new aerodynamics and 18,000-pound thrust class engine produce quick, tight turns. With a combat thrust-to-weight ratio of better than one, the F-20 has the power to rapidly accelerate above corner velocity. The Tiger Shark is hard to see and has a very low radar cross-section. It has no restrictions or limiters on angle of attack, roll rate, or yaw. An advanced digital flight control system lets you do exactly what you want, even through hard maneuvers. The F-20 is powered by the most advanced and dependable production engine in the world. You don't have to worry about compressor stalls or throttle restrictions in the Tiger Shark. That's not the way it is in most fighters. Throttle bursts from idle to full afterburner have been achieved at 45,000 feet at 47 knots. Unthinkable in most current frontline fighters. For air to surface missions, the need is for payload radius, accurate navigation and weapons delivery day or night in adverse weather and at low altitudes. The F-20 carries a variety of ordnance, Maverick missiles, 30 millimeter gun pod, laser guided bombs, as well as the harpoon and conventional weapons. Loaded with five Mark 82 bombs and sidewinders for self-protection and two 330 gallon fuel tanks, the Tiger Shark has a combat radius and a low, low, low mission profile of more than 340 nautical miles. Its high, low, high combat radius in the same configuration is 550 nautical miles. And with the F-20's laser inertial navigator, you're off the ground and on the way to your target more rapidly and more accurately than in any other tactical fighter. A single F-20, configured as a tanker, can extend the strike range of a flight of four Tiger Sharks by more than 25%. The F-20 radar's real beam ground mapping mode has a range of 80 miles to help you navigate and locate the target at low altitudes. The freeze mode lets you continue to navigate without emitting radar energy, increasing your chances for surprise and survival. A single switch calls up weapons release programs stored prior to takeoff. 
a conformal countermeasure system, chaff flare, radar warning receiver, and the agility of the tiger shark enhance survivability. The Doppler beam sharpening mode allows for precise target designation. Used with the night and all-weather CCRP mode, it permits automatic weapons delivery system accuracy of 5.9 mils, or 60 feet. In the visual CCIP mode, system accuracy is within 3.9 mils, or 47 feet. With the f 20 smart avionics, or smart weapons, you can allocate your aircraft to destroy a wider array of targets. The multi-role Tiger Shark also gives the tactical air commander the combined capability to conduct both strike and surveillance missions over water. With the F-20 radar's Doppler processing mode in C-2 operation, vessels in rough sea states are shown on a clutter-free display. With the freeze and moving target modes, you increase your chances for surprise by firing a harpoon missile from over the horizon. Flying at 4,000 feet with three 330-gallon fuel tanks, the F-20 on a single mission patrols 60,000 square miles, equal to two-thirds of the Arabian Gulf or the entire Gulf of Thailand. The U.S. Air Force Flight Test Center where the F-20 has met or bettered all planned performance, reliability, and maintainability objectives. Tiger Shark was designed from the beginning with reliability and maintainability in mind. Over the past two years, Tiger Sharks have logged more than 800 test and demonstration flights with a combined mission availability rate of 97%. F-20s have been flown by U.S. Air Force and Navy pilots and the pilots of more than 15 other countries. F-20 performance, reliability and maintainability have been evaluated by the U.S. Air Force, which has overseen the Tiger Shark program from the start. In late 1983, the Tiger Shark began a series of weapons demonstration tests and confirmed its ferry range by flying unrefueled from Edwards Air Force Base, California to Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., a distance of more than 2,000 nautical miles. In a recent test at Edwards Air Force Base, the F-20 displayed its unique designed in reliability and maintenance features. During the realistic exercise simulating the first day of combat, the F-20 was tasked to fly continuous intercept missions against simulated targets. Turnaround time of the Tiger Shark is less than 15 minutes. F-20s are 50% more reliable than current frontline fighters and need less than half the maintenance and 40% fewer maintenance personnel. In the 12-hour period of the exercise, the Tiger Shark completed 12 missions. With the designed in reliability of the F-20, tactical air commanders can sustain sortie rates 40% higher than with current frontline fighters. Modern technology with new levels of reliability produces a new standard of sortie rates, a new kind of tactical advantage. A third F-20 joined the Tiger Shark flight demonstration and test program in May. F-20 deliveries are scheduled to begin 24 months from go-ahead. The F-20 Tiger Shark. America's newest and most reliable tactical fighter. By every measure, a new generation fighter with a new generation of modern technology for combat performance and air power reliability.